And now, it's the Wide Shut Webcast. Hello and welcome to the Wide Shut Webcast at wideshut.co.uk. I'm your host, Keelan Balderson. Once revered as an award-winning undercover journalist at the News of the World and Sun on Sunday, Mazir Mahmood was disgraced in 2015 when he was charged with conspiring to pervert the course of justice. Posing under the guise of a wealthy Arab sheikh, he entrapped singer Tulisa Contostavlos with promises of movie deals alongside the likes of Leonardo DiCaprio. She was pressured into supplying the journalist cocaine, but the evidence was cherry-picked in Mahmoud's favour, and his driver changed a statement in which Tulisa had professed to be anti-drugs. It soon unravelled that Mahmoud, under his fake shake and other personas, had a long track record of dodgy sting operations, entrapping dozens of celebrities, would-be terrorists and members of the public. Plied with drink, his victims, many who maintained they were subject to entirely fraudulent evidence and intimidation, were often enticed with money and career advancement if they carried out his illegal activities. Ultimately, they were never rewarded. What they did get was a sleazy tabloid headline and a knock at the door from the police. Today I talked to Alex Smith, a stage hypnotist known as Jonathan Royal, who made his name in the 90s trolling the morning and daytime TV circuit. He appeared as a repeated expert guest discussing everything from love rats to reading people's belly buttons to tell their fortune. This knack for getting his name in the media led him to come face to face with Mazer Mahmood. This is the story of what happened when the fake Sheikh met the fake guest with the fake coins. I was born uh, 13th of August 1975 into a show business family whilst my parents were travelling with Gandhi Circus here in England and at the time my mum was a sharp shooting, whip cracking, rope spinning, knife throwing cowgirl. My dad did uh, was a circus clown, Tizzy the Clown, but also did a fire eating, bed of nails sort of yogi fakir act under the name The Amazing Etna. Um, so I was born as they were travelling with the circus and indeed as um, if people want to see embarrassing pictures of me they can go on my website but at about the age of three and a half I made my stage debut as Britain Jungies paid circus clown for my dad. So yeah a bit, a bit of an unusual upbringing. So what was that like sort of travelling around and uh, I mean it's, it's quite a unique lifestyle. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things, the grass is always green and there's a lot of truth in, in that. It's, it sounds great, the idea of, oh, moving here, moving there, but the reality of it is it's a very closed community because obviously you know the people who are on the circuits, but you don't really know people in most of the areas you're going to unless you happen to land somewhere where you're, you know, already knew somebody. So, you know, in many ways it can be quite lonely. Show business seems all razzle dazzle, um, but the, the truth and reality is that behind the scenes, when the makeup comes off, you know, and the lights turn out in the theatres or in this case the circus ring, um, it, it, it's not quite as glamorous as it may appear. How did that work out with schooling and and being a child? Well, interesting, my mum didn't come from a... Well, my dad didn't originally come from a show business background, actually. He genuinely did, as a kid, run away and join the circus, as cliched as that may sound. Um, but my mum had no background at all prior to, me, to meeting my dad and, uh, and getting married to him. And she wanted me to have uh, as normal whatever normal is, uh, an upbringing as possible. So when I was approaching sort of six, she insisted that 
uh, we get a house and she'd get a proper job and I'd go to a normal school and only then perform at weekends, school holidays and um, evenings and stuff. So my dad still travelled with the circus, but I had to go to a normal school and the upshot of that was suddenly I went from performing and being in the limelight all the time and I'd just been in the... Um, Daily Mirror, British national newspaper, with the headline, Alex the Circus Six Hit. Because I just turned six years old, and there's a picture of me as uh, Flap the Clown. That that particular article's on the resume page of my website, um, magicalguru.com. People want to have a laugh at how ridiculous I looked. And that caused the teachers to at that particular school to, arguably, the, the, the teachers started bullying me and victimising me. I was getting this national publicity, and um, it was made clear that I got paid when I performed. And I suppose on a pro rata basis, uh, as in like an hourly rate, if you calculated it that way, um, I was earning more than the teachers. Um, jealousy came in and they made my life uh, hell. Um, Were you sort yeah. of settled at, at one school or did you have to sort of move around we, a bit? Or Well, we, the plan was to settle at one school, but when I was getting victimised, we, we, we moved to another town. And I'm glad to say when I started going to that primary school and, hey, the teachers were brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Couldn't have asked for anything better. The trouble is that the kids then started bullying me for being the odd one out. So I kind of grew to resent my dad because when I was tiny, I, you know, obviously I didn't really have much in the way of choice. I kind of did, but to me it just seemed normal to do, because I was born on the circus, it seemed normal. It was the environment. Um, but I grew to resent it and I thought the bullying was ultimately my dad's fault because he got me into performing. And, and by this sort of... Um, by the time I was about eight, I really resented it. Well, no, more like about nine. But by then, I kind of formed an addiction to the sound of an audience clapping or laughing at the right times, uh, that buzz that performers talk about. So on the one hand, uh, I didn't want to be bullied anymore, and I resented the being the circus clown bit, so my logic said, get back at your dad and stop the bullying by refusing to do being a clown anymore. Well, what sort of things was your act... You know, what did it involve? What was a typical sort of performance for you? Oh, crikey. Well, the, the, the clowning stuff is the stereotypical, as you would imagine, slapstick, flipping, you know, custard pies in the face, buckets of water, apparently accidentally getting dropped on your head, <laughs> um, oversized shoes, oversized comedy pro just just silly, ridiculous slapstick stuff, exactly as you would imagine. Uh, if you've never been to the circus, what it would be like. Um, that was until I was about, as I say, about nine, because then I refused to do it. But I still wanted that buzz from the performing, and because my hobby, I was getting paid to be a circus clown up till then, but my hobby was magic, like Paul Daniels, David Copperfield, Conjuring, Rabbits from the Hats, Card Tricks, all that kind of stuff. So I started doing a magic act on a more professional level, i.e. getting paid for it. Um, and that fulfilled that need for the audience's attention. So did the, the hypnotism come later? Was that an outgrowth of that performance-based stuff? Yeah, I mean, it went, well, it was a bit of both, what it was. Um, I was still getting bullied when I was doing the magic. It's just at least I felt a little bit more control because it was my choice to have done that. Um, and when I was at the li library... Um, one day where the magic books were in the adult section even though I was only uh, you know sort of probably about 12 at the time uh, I got permission to go to the adult library because I'd been in the local papers they knew that the magic books in the kids libraries I was a bit beyond them to say the least um, so I was getting out these proper good magic books that they got into the library ordered in and they were on the shelf next to uh, the self-help section and I saw a book there called how to win friends and influence people and I thought hang on a minute I read that use the techniques and that'll stop me getting bullied the title says it all well, I got it, I read it, and let me tell you, uh, the techniques are pretty useless on other kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a bit of a dated book even then, wasn't it? Well, to be honest, the techniques are really good uh, if used with common sense in the world of the adult, not in the world of the school playground. Right. 
uh, with the slight problem, so I was grasping at straws a bit. However, when I took that book back, I saw there was a book on self-hypnosis, and it, on the back it said that it would help you feel more confident and stuff, and at school I was starting to withdraw into myself. I was fine on the stage, but at school I was a bit like, oh, try and keep your head down, and maybe, you know, you won't get picked on as much. So I started using some of the self-hypnosis techniques, and they certainly did work in terms of helping to increase my self-confidence in more normal, everyday situations, shall we say, rather than performing. Um, and there were a few psychological techniques taught in there, a thing called the law of reversed effort. Um, and the idea behind this, a guy called Emil, Emil Coué, who's famous for the phrase, day by day in every way, uh, I'm getting better and better positive affirmations he also discovered that when you're when the human conscious mind and your imagination are in conflict the imagination is the stronger force and will tend to win he also discovered that it, it what i now call the yoda principle yoda says you know in star wars films do or do not there is no try because the word try implies and entertains the possibility of failure making it more likely that you will fail because you put that suggestion into your mind uh, that was the principle so one day when uh, the school bully decided to pin me against a wall and i figured i had nothing to lose because i was going to get hit again like happen pretty regularly i just turned around and thought sod it i'll try something from the book and i went hang on before you hit me just um you know it was a bit crap last time you hit me it was a bit of a waste of time and he looked at me a bit like what the hell are you on about um i said so if you can try and do a better job this time you know at least make it worthwhile you know so go on try try and he just looked at me like you've severely lost the plot uh, a total state of confusion well, in NLP and hypnosis, that's called a pattern interrupt. I didn't know that then. And arguably, it had sensory overloaded his critical faculty, analytical area of his brain, because it was so unexpected and nonsensical that I would be saying something like that in that context, yeah. that it just caused confusion, disorientation. And the upshot was he suddenly let go of me, walked off. He was effing and jeffing at the same time, like going effing, idiot <laughs> don't come effing near me but here's the thing it never came near me again so suddenly i realized there's something more to this so i sought out a proper training course there was a publication in britain i point that out for anyone who's listening elsewhere called the exchange of mart um a magazine and it had a, a but you could buy and sell pretty much anything in it and there was a business opportunities section and in there a company called the association of professional hypnotherapist and psychotherapist run by uh, a gentleman called dr brian howard uh had an advertisement each week become a, a professional diploma bearing hypnotherapist and learn the craft of stage hypnotism and i thought oh hypnotherapy help people also help myself and stage hypnosis entertaining so i can get the laughter and applause this sounds like a perfect combination so i sent off for the um prospectus stamped addressed envelope i sent off no emails in those days uh yes listeners there was another way of doing things in the past um and the prospectus came through and ultimately and remember this was 1989 and i was only 14 i sent off 125 pounds of our united kingdom british pound sterling and in return i received a whole package of training manuals and audio cassettes um some people may not know what those are but that's what we used to have before mp3s audio cassettes <laughs> And I studied the manuals, the audio cassettes, then I took the mail order exam and I passed. But obviously I'd lied about my age because the thing said you had to be over 18. So I did pass the exam, but then I realized mm, I better come clean because sooner or later they might find out. So I contacted them and said, look, sorry about this. I was so eager to learn that I lied on the application form. And ultimately the kind of, wrapped me on the knuckles and said, well, we better issue you a new certificate then with your proper date of birth on, given that um, at the end of the day, you did pass the exam with an, a, a, you know, an incredibly high pass rate. And that was a pretty robust, legitimate course. It wasn't one of these kind of 
cons you, you learned some pretty valuable stuff well uh, it, it, it must have been like put it in a nutshell from that moment of having passed from the age of 14 although yes i did lie to the media about my age because i knew that um i knew that perhaps whilst on the one hand the local newspaper would run articles about a 14 year old passing a hypnosis course i figured that potential clients probably wouldn't take a 14 year old too seriously so i made out that i was 18 uh just turned 18 apparently um and but was still the youngest person which was true i was the youngest person to have got qualified by the aphp um so the, the the local media did run with it and obviously there was still then some credibility uh prestige level with potential clients and but from there on in yeah i mean third near enough 30 well just over 30 years on yes i've done other courses a lot over the years um i now actually teach other people um arguably i've taught more people around the world who are now successful comedy stage hypnotists filling theaters doing tv shows and also hypnotherapists uh tv television life coaches you name it i've taught the majority of them that are actually successful today but it all started by my road a journey on that level from that mail order course that i was so impressed by that um, in the early to mid 90s, I actually bought the rights off Dr. Brian Howard to uh, supply the course to my students. Let's jump to the 90s then. You've made a name for yourself. You're doing stage stuff and hip- hypnotherapy as well. Or... Yeah. And uh, you, you started getting some TV presence as well. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd done television before, but that was as a magician or as um, a circus clown. Um, you know, I'd, my first telly was when I was eight years old as a circus clown. And that, as I said, that video's on my website. People want to have a laugh at Flap the Clown. Um, um, but hypnosis-wise, yeah, my first, my first radio and media coverage on a local and regional level was when I was 14, although they said I was 18 at the time. I was actually 18 in the media for about, don't blimey, for about six years. It wasn't until I was about genuinely 20 that I um, started to tell the truth about my uh, age. Why why they never twigged on? I'll tell you why they never twigged on, something we'll come to later, the fact that they really don't care less about the truth of the media. But, but, um... Yeah, so I got on my first major television as a hypnotist was January 1993 on a cult Channel 4 television show called The Word, where I was on there with um, fellow world famous hypnotist Peter Powers uh, in a kind of battle of the hypnotist competition. Now, according to Channel 4 and The Word, because they, they weren't too sure about the laws, they, on the broadcast, told everyone I was 18. In right. truth, it was January 1993, so I was still only 17 years of age, despite what they said. So I was the youngest, and as far as I'm aware, still the youngest hypnotist to ever perform on uh, British, probably, arguably, European television as well, but certainly British TV to this day. Well, this is what I'm finding quite interesting about your story, is how you've been able to use the... I guess the the staged nature of of the media, the sort of narcissism of the producers, and I know there was a series of articles and things way back in the day about guesting on multiple shows and sort of <laughs> appearing yeah. around when I think when it, wasn't it the Trisha show and stuff like that. Oh, there was tons of them. I mean, there was a there was a period of several years in the kind of mid. Mid, mainly mid to late 90s, but it also happened a little bit in the early 90s now and again. Not so much, just enough to prove that despite the fact that by then I'd already exposed myself as Britain's biggest media prankster, um, that they would still fall for it because they don't do enough due diligence. And frankly, they don't. They're not bothered about truth, reality and facts. What television, radio, newspaper and magazines in the main are bothered about is viewing figures, um, sales, and being able to sell advertising space. The media as a whole is generally run by accountants, and if they can make money, 
they do not really care much about the truth. So they'll turn a blind eye or they'll blatantly fabricate um, fake stories which I was involved in for a number of years on well over 100 different TV shows uh, around the world uh, and radio shows galore, print media, every national newspaper, Sunday paper you can think of, magazines, you name it. was featured in the main a myriad of different names with the most extreme and bizarre stories from uh, being a man addicted to Quaver's crisps who apparently had <laughs> 40 bags a day. <laughs> okay. To being a guy who apparently had won the national lottery and uh, bedded this page three girl, only for her to be incredibly angry to discover that I'd only won forty-four pounds because I'd only got four numbers. Um, there was a time when I was featured every day on the front page of the Daily Sport with a paper bag on my head as Nigel Brown, the guy who apparently, in protest of. Prince, the late Princess Diana uh, being involved with Dodi Fayad that was wearing a paper bag on my head and said I wouldn't take it off until she left him. Um, that, that ran and ran and I was supposed to be doing a UK tour as the comedy compare with the paper bag on my head for the Sunday Sport Page 3 Girls Roadshow. But unfortunately, a couple of days before that tour was going to start, uh, I woke up to the news that Princess Di had been um, had been murdered. Sorry, I had a tragic accident in, in yeah, a tunnel. Mm, yeah, well, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so you name it, the most bizarre of stories. I've, 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 I've apparently collected snails and my fiancé at the time wanted me to get rid of them and to hit the media and then we ended up on um, a BBC show called All Rise for Julie and Clary where he acted as the judge and decided whether I should get rid of them or not which he did decide that I should get rid of them and funnily enough I'd only got them out of my garden uh, the day before going up to London uh, to do the filming but they uh, I don't know if they're still well they won't be alive all these years on but afterwards I managed to convince the security guard that I'd been told I hadn't but it was just for my own fun I managed to convince the security guard that um, because I'd been told I had to get rid of them that I had to get rid of them there and I wasn't allowed to take them home so he needed to show me the way to the Blue Peter Garden and this security guard actually took me and unlocked the Blue Peter Garden wow. where I set the snails free I got a photograph of this and then I leaked that photograph to the national newspapers on the basis that um, I'd released them and now the, the Blue Peter Garden was overrun with snails. The, I mean, the sad thing is it's even easier these days to create complete nonsense, fabricated realities uh, for the internet. Um, and ironically, it's still just as easy to do the same for so-called conventional print media and television and radio because, if anything, more than ever, they're less. They're not really bothered. I know they keep going on on on, on the apparent mainstream news about beware fake news, but the yeah. irony of it is the biggest fake news providers are the mainstream media. And, well, they're and desperate for money tame, now, aren't they? Because it's yeah, it's pretty much sort of tanking. So. They'll do anything really to get eyes on on the papers or on the shows or whatever on the websites. They genuinely, I, I have so many experiences. Even I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I, I it was quite clear. I, I, I went on a, a, a cult channel for a breakfast show in England called The Big Breakfast. You can see clips of it on YouTube if you're listening to this in different countries. And I went on one time with this fabricated story that I was a fortune teller for dogs. I did what I called paulology, and I would read their polls and tell their futures. Right. Um, and the great thing is dogs can't uh, talk back and tell you whether what you're saying is right or wrong. Beautiful. You imagine there are the four pads at the top and there's one at the bottom. Yeah. It's like the life pad, head pad, love pad, look pad, health pad. Okay. Um, but yeah, I was doing this on live TV on The Big Breakfast and Keith Chegwin, the British TV presenter, game show host, was the host of that particular section. Now, they changed the host practically every week on The Big Breakfast. They did cycles. So the chances were, if you went back on the show in a few weeks' time, you'd have different presenters. So with that in mind, I created a different persona, a different name, and obviously I would either dye my hair a different colour, dress a bit differently. Um, and came up with this idea that I read people's belly buttons to tell their future. Navel gazing. 
It sounds like Jackie Stallone when she used to read people's arses. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, yeah, very similar. Um, except this predates that. Um, and I got back on the show. But lo and behold, my luck was not in. Who turned out to the presenter that day? Keith Chegwin. And yes, I had a slightly different outfit on, and me, but I'm sorry, you could have, if you'd have presented a, a show with me as a guest on it two weeks early, and you're the one who'd spent time with me in the green room prepping in advance, you would have known it was me. He never said a word. He knew it was me, I could tell by the way he looked and winked at me on the kid. He didn't say a word because he knew it was going to make a good water cooler moment, as they call it, something ridiculous on TV that people would be talking about. Well, that's what I was going to say, because some of the news articles at the time when they started exposing the scandals, they painted you as sort of like the bad guy. But they knew the score, didn't they? They knew what was going on. The vast majority of them knew. All right, there were some that I probably did pull the wool of the eyes over them, or some that contacted me because they'd see me in a national newspaper that I'd tricked into doing a story, and their researchers contacted uh, and brought me on to their TV or radio show on the basis of that article. But... Uh, so they may have genuinely believed the the, the, the the scenario, but the thing is they really, if they'd done a bit more due diligence and investigation, that's the thing. They didn't because deep down they weren't bothered mm. because it fulfilled what they required. And then there were other times like the Kilroy show, chat show on BBC in England, um, BBC, British Brainwashing Corporation. But anyway... Um, they had a morning daily chat show called Kilroy, and it's one ITV had a show coming on, which was the was it Vanessa or Trisha show? I think it was Trisha show. I think Vanessa was the one that got axed. Trisha so, kept going, but yeah, yeah, it might. Be. I don't know. It's the first day that they were going to be broadcast head to head together, so that ITV had purposely bought their morning uh, debate chat show on at the same time as BBC's Kilroy in a ratings battle war. And the BBC contacted me and said, uh, "I was known as Alex back then, or one of many different names." But they contacted me, knowing me as Alex, and they said, "Look, it's the first day that we're head to head. It's a live show." We need something outrageous, truly outrageous. It's about getting publicity. It's about uh, getting the headlines and beating ITV in the ratings war. So they paid me. It was only a nominal fee, but I knew that I could get money out of the print media as well for exclusive stories, apparently, afterwards. And ultimately, that is the show where um, I... Um, Flashed my tackle, dropped my pants. Uh, um, and it, needless to say, it made the front page of every national UK newspaper, all of whom paid me nominal fees for a different exclusive story. They all got a different story because they're all made up anyway. And, um, yeah, they, 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 they knew full well. They booked me on purpose. That's what they wanted. The world of media fabrication that Alex had ingratiated himself in soon took a much darker turn. The fake Sheikh was a trickster of a different kind. He had the backing of the Murdoch Empire and the CPS. Mazza Mahmood, aka the fake Sheikh, uh, is the former, although some would argue he's still working on the QT, uh, employee journalist, or rather criminal with a National Union of Journalist membership card, um, of Rupert Murdoch's News of the World and Sun on Sunday newspapers in England. And, yeah, he, he, the News of the World in the 90s, especially and into the noughties, but it was mainly the 90s, really pushed the boat in terms of getting scandalous stories on celebrities, politicians, uh, and, uh, and people and stuff. But the more you looked at them, the more you realised that, wow, this is an amazing coincidence how many, apparently, celebrities or politicians are willing to supply someone they've only just apparently met with um, cocaine or, 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 or to do something else uh, illegal or, at the least, you know, somewhat unethical or immoral. And if you looked at it as a whole, rather than just weekly apparent scandalous news, you, anyone with a functioning brain cell would think this 
there's something not quite right here. And I, by about the uh, mid night, well, I've saved circa around 95, 96, was working with a freelance journalist who also knew that my stories were fabricated. Yeah. But it helped by by him approaching newspapers with them. It meant that I wasn't the first part of call, so it made them seem more believable, like some journalist had found it. And he would make money out of it, selling it to the paper. So he was happy. I was happy because then I made me money off the TV shows and stuff that came on the back of it. And he actually, during his freelance work, worked on undercover stories with Maza Mahmood. And I got to know him very well. And he he ultimately told me, I knew I knew Maza Mahmood what he looked like before it was general knowledge. Okay. Because this guy had worked with him. Um, I didn't meet Maza Mahmood in person, but I knew what he looked like, and I knew what his modest operandi was. And when I'd had this explained to me, I realised that his modest operandi ultimately was dishonest to say the least, and arguably highly illegal in many elements. It was but to me that ultimately people were entrapped, manipulated, um, and arguably even to the extent of them being drugged without their knowledge, date rape type drugs like GHB uh, being put in their drinks to make them um, more easily manipulated uh, into agreeing to doing things they would never normally do. Actual um, threats of violence, in implied threats of violence from the people playing the parts of his bodyguards and stuff behind the scenes, and a whole bunch of other nefarious, certainly illegal and immoral, um, but quite often illegal techniques to fabricate a completely fake story with no real foundation in truth, or at best... That was more often than not. Or at best, take something that was a minor story, but manipulate it so that other things appeared to have occurred, which hadn't in the way they were portrayed, to turn it into apparently some major apparent scandal. And so good he got at this, did Mahmood, that um, he, he, you know, he, he let he, he caused a number of people to actually get prison sentences. The Tulisa case proved Maza Mahmood was not above tampering with evidence. Former boxing champion Herbie Hyde, who the fake Sheikh accused of match-fixing and supplying him with cocaine, maintains text message evidence was simply made up. Mahmood had so much evidence, so much which he created himself. Like he said, he said, I sent him a text saying that I... I wrote him a text saying that I've got the cocaine and the match fixing. I cannot spell cocaine. Nevertheless, match fixing. All I, I can't spell them words. Prison, I cried every day. And, and I thought in prison, I might as well kill myself if I want to put this thing to, to, to my family. You know? I'm proud of you. You know, you know what I'm saying? You've indicated. So that, that, that was how I felt. I thought I might as well end it. Often he just put words in the mouth and made them up and there was no recordings to prove they'd ever said certain things or done certain things, as we now know. But if uh, he did have recordings of them saying something, funny enough, the bits that had been said before that sentence or the bits afterwards, or the recording had gone wrong. Well, without those bits, it was totally out of context and made something completely innocent seem yeah. dodgy. Why do you think he had such a close relationship with the police and the courts and things? Why why was he given such power to, to go and do these things? Was it just a mutually beneficial thing? or? Well, that's the thing. I mean, ultimately, what he was doing is a non-state entrapment, um, which means that it's entrapment, but not by a police officer, which um, some argue is uh, permissible in law, but were a police officer to do the things in the course of an investigation, certainly in, in England, that he did, in the way he did, out and out entrapment and fabrication and whatnot, it would never be admissible in court, it would never make it to court. 
and it turns out that there's evidence out there that the the police and the Crown Prosecution Service in England both knew that Mazen Mahmood was not really on any level a witness of trust uh, and in fact was dishonest and involved with criminal activities and connections um, as far back as sort of around 1996. There's evidence, it may even predate that, but there's definitely evidence out there in the public domain that I link to on my site, circusofthemind.net, where the CPS and police definitely knew of his links to a company called Southern Investigations, Yes, yeah. Uh, one of its owners being linked with the, you know, linked in news stories, uh, never been charged with anything uh, regarding the Mo Daniel Morgan murder. But Daniel Morgan um, is the most investigated murder in British history, and yet they've still not uh, actually charged successfully anyone with the murder. But they have definitely shown that Daniel, who was one of the people who founded Southern Investigations, that there are that there's dodgy stuff surrounding his former business associates, and that Southern Investigations, those dodgy people that remained, regularly did uh, stuff, including things of um, an illegal nature, for Mazamamud. And also, it's coming to light literally in the past couple of months in the High Court in London, also arguably for other leading national daily newspapers and journalists as well. You obviously have your story. How did that all come about? Because to well, me, that <laughs> on the face of it, it sounds very cartoonish, right? Fake yeah. coins in a hotel room. Mm. It doesn't seem like a real scenario. Talk us through it. How, how did that go down? Who yeah. approached who? Okay. Well, you've got to bear in mind is that if you actually look at what really happened with pretty much all of his stories, they were all pretty cartoonish. Let's be honest. You know, who, which famous television actors, such as my friend, you know, um, John Alford, former Grange Hill and London's Burning Star, yeah. um, he was stitched up by, by my mood. Unfortunately, I didn't know John until after that had happened. Otherwise, um, he'd have never have got stitched up the way he did because, um, you know, he, all of those things I talked about, manipulation, editing, evidence and all that, all of that came into it. But also, it, it's such a ridiculous scenario that a rich oil shake or his... Uh, right hand man acting on behalf of the rich oil shake who is going to be offering you a, a television series or a part in a film with your idols that it's so ridiculous and with the bodyguards apparently they're around because there's a full cast of people they have around them and money's no expense that it's so ridiculous it can't be anything but real because who the hell would go to that expense and effort yeah, I see what you mean. Um, so anyway, in my case, unlike the others, I I'm slightly unique in that I openly, and I've always said from day one, and anyone can check this, I've put it in printing interviews, I've said it consistently, um, my story, my, well, I'm not even, I don't even like the word story, my uh, factual statement of events has been 100% identical since 1998. Nothing has changed, which is what you find when someone is relating facts. Um, now, obviously, there'll be sceptical listeners. That's why I've got that website, circusofthemind.net, so people can see the evidence as well that backs up what I'm about to say. But in a nutshell, I had scammed and been involved with all these fabricated stories with TV, radio, newspapers, magazines. As I mentioned before, I I'd come to realise that the majority of them had little, if any, regard for the truth. And, that it is, and it is sadly to this day, 95% of the stuff you read in newspapers is probably fabricated and made up. And the other 5% has a grain of truth in it that's manipulated and twisted to suit the agenda of that newspaper owner or the people that are throwing enough money their way. And it sadly, sadly is still the case. 
And I thought, right, how could I get maximum publicity and use it as a launch pad to take my career to the next level, which was that I, I had a desire to get into sort of television presenting. I'd done some television presenting, but I, I, I wanted to proper get into that area uh, and move away from just doing the odd scams here and there in between, uh, you know, media pranks in between going off and doing my hypnosis shows or, or treating people therapeutically. So then it occurred to me, well, what if, and this would also mean that I had to stop doing the media pranks, what if I exposed myself and came clean about all the TV shows, radio shows, newspaper articles, magazine articles? And I thought, eh, there's a problem with that. Who the heck's going to run the story? Because I've pretty much been featured by them all. So then I thought, it needs an angle. It needs something that will bring that out. People will find out about it, and by virtue of me having exposed myself, it will mean that I will then not be tempted to make any easy money from doing any further media pranks. So I can draw a line under that kind of thing and concentrate on, 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 on the future career path. And then I thought, you know what? It, Mahmood's name kept jumping in my head because I, I kept seeing the, the, the coverage that the weekly stories would get and strangely my you know my friendly freelance journalist at the time that i mentioned earlier started suggesting to me well you could always go and um we could engineer a meeting with uh Maza mahmoud uh but you pretend you don't know it's him and you could offer to get him some you know hookers call girls escorts female escorts to the hotel room and then you leave, make excuses and leave, and he'll run the story that, you know, this hypnotherapist to the stars uh, and guy who's pranked all these TV shows, that would be a way of getting it out, prank, you know, um, uh, was a pimp. <laughs> and But something about his body language, remember I studied body language and all that stuff as part of the hypnosis, something wasn't right. And I thought... I fulfilled my use to you, haven't I, Mr. Freelance Journalist? It's becoming very difficult for you now to sell any more of these. So was, was this a double cross? I, I, I sensed it was, and it later turned out that I, my gut instinct was right. So thankfully, my gut instinct was right, and what I decided to do was I sent an apparently anonymous letter, uh, and as bizarre as this sounds, bear in mind this all got proven without... You know, with it, with no reasonable doubt, it, it left in anyone's mind. This was proven to be reality to the police and to the courts, as we'll come to shortly. I sent a, an apparently anonymous letter via sign for delivery to the chief investigations officer of the News of the World, i.e., the fake Sheikh Mazen Mahmood. And upon that, it, it, it from this anonymous source i.e. me, it said that the celebrity hypnotherapist at the time, stage name Alex Leroy, um, stage hypnotist, and also Kiddies TV presenter, because I was doing a bit of uh, magic uh, slots on Nickelodeon at the time, um, was actually a, a pimp and supplied girls for porn films and, and such like. And... Uh, you know, this is disgusting and really someone needs to do something about it. Oh, and by the way, all these, loads of these shows, this person, the Chris man was him and, you know, it re revealed the truth about various media scams and said, here's his private number. Well, I bought a SIM card and a cheap phone to stick it in. So that the only person on the planet who had that telephone number was me and the chief the moment he opened that letter, the chief investigations officer of the News of the World, namely Mazen Mahmood. So I would know if that number ever got called, it was either Mahmood or somebody working on his behalf because nobody else had the number. And sure enough, a couple of days after the sign for delivery letter getting delivered, it rang. And it was somebody claiming to be called Perry Khan, 
claiming they've been given uh, my contact details of someone else that I'd supplied girls to for a, a, for an adult film, which obviously was bullshit because I'd never done so, but he tied in with the narrative he'd been given, and that he wanted to meet because he had a rich boss in Saudi Arabia who, who wanted to... He had an adult side of his business, and he also had a, a family side of his business, and that he'd heard of the grapevine that... Um, Perhaps I was looking at moving into uh, television presenting and that perhaps if I could help out his boss with the adult side supplying girls that um, he could help out in getting me presenting work. And let's, you know, let's meet in person, which is what I figured would happen. And it did. So I went and met up with him at the Piccadilly Hotel in Manchester in full knowledge that I was going to be meeting Mazza Mahmood, the fake shake. Okay. Uh, so I went with um, a pocket dictaphone, audio tape recorder on me, and I recorded that meeting. I had proof that I knew who I was going into, that I'd sent that sign for a letter. I had proof of that that was shown to the police, proof that I sent it. Plus I had the audio recording of that first meeting and some audio from... Uh, other meetings, although I didn't have full for the other meetings because the tape ran out. And it genuinely did because I, I didn't have the facility of having a team of people hidden in a, a back room behind a two-way mirror or with hidden cameras who were able to change tapes. I was acting solely on my own. But I had enough evidence to prove that I went in there with the intention of exposing him, his team, and his unethical, immoral, uh, and illegal uh, mythologies and techniques when it came to it but this continued and that weekend came i did supply some well i didn't supply any girls i, ran, I actually took uh, uh, the telephone number from the back of the manchester evening newspaper newspaper for a, a, a massage parlor rang it from his hotel phone and asked for a couple of girls to show up at eight o'clock that night and left his hotel room the girls clearly did show up um uh, as we later found out but the point is i wasn't there i'd done nothing illegal um but i was expecting the sensationalized story to appear that sunday and it didn't strangely and i thought that's weird and then mr khan i.e mazza mahmood but rings up on the uh monday tuesday going I, we need another meeting my boss w wants some advice so i go at the meeting and then there becomes talk of well, let's cut to the chase. There becomes talk of, can you get hold of drugs? What else can you get hold of? And I thought, sod it, I'll say whatever. I'll say the most ridiculous, outrageous things because I can prove that I'm recording this. Uh, I, I know who they are, that it's complete and utter tosh. So I said, ooh, you know, for the right price, can get anything. Guns, drugs, Uzi guns, um, <laughs> drugs, uh, counterfeit, money, literally anything. And for some reason, he jumped on the counterfeit money mention. Well, he jumped on drugs and counterfeit money. He said, yeah, get, get me some cocaine and get me some um, counterfeit mo uh, pound coins. Uh, and I went, all right, I'll look into it. No intentions whatsoever. Absolutely zero intentions. I figure sooner or later he'll get bored, realise he's not getting these things, just run with the hooker showing up at the hotel room story, then I can come out with, to a rival publication with, here's the recordings of what really went on, and look, it doesn't really bear any relation to what's written in this article, that's because the guy's Mr Billy Bullshit. If you're enjoying this episode of the Wide Shut webcast, be sure to give it a like and a share, or leave a comment, and if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. You all appreciate so another meeting took place, and at this meeting, when I walked in, just behind where Mahmood was sat, playing the part of Perry Khan, was a table with stacks of 20 and 50 pound notes on it. There must have been thousands of pounds stacked up in eye shot. This never showed up on his video recordings. He had his videos set up so that you wouldn't see that, but it was there in eye shot. Very clever psychological ploy if it was being used on someone who wasn't of the state of mind I was, which was that I knew it was bullshit. And in the lift, um, going 
up to the meetings. His bodyguard would meet me downstairs. The apparent bodyguard, I believe that was somebody from Southern Investigations, I'm led to believe, that used to play the part of his bodyguard. But anyway, um, would say in the lift, you make sure you help my, don't upset my boss type of thing. Uh, things get nasty when people upset my boss. There was, there was definitely intimidation and fear being instilled, veiled threats to people happening um before what, they were what did you what did you feel like at that point were, were you were you scared did you think you should pull out did you you know well i was i, I, I was a bit scared but i thought well they're not going to go through with anything violent are they because it's actually a story they're using this as a psychological ploy to manipulate people into doing things they may not normally do obviously i'm not in any real danger am i little did i know i've since found since then that arguably I was in real danger. Southern investigation, remember, had been linked to the most investigated murder in British history. They'd yeah. been linked to all manner of, of dodgy stuff, and it's, so <laughs> apparently I was uh, I was potentially in danger. Um, and so I, yeah, I was a bit a bit a bit, a bit concerned. I thought, um, what, what the fuck do I do? And I'm I'm in there, and he goes, when are you going to get these drugs? When are you going to get counterfeit money? And I'm just talking shit because I don't know where to get any of the stuff and I had no intentions of anyway. And I said, look, I'll try, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll really, I'll, get, I'll give it my best shot. And he goes, well, how much will it be? And, and, and I, I fucking, on the way up in the lift, his bodyguard had mentioned to me that the going rate was x amount of pounds for cocaine in the area he'd heard and had mentioned to me that it was x amount of pounds to get counterfeit money it was uh, i seem to recall he said it was like 400 uh, no yes 400 quid i think to get 1000 counterfeit pound coins he'd mentioned this to me so i just threw those figures out in the room left no intention to doing anything except as i'm leaving my mood, as Mr. in his character of Perry Khan, picks up money and he goes, oh, that's 400 quid, you said. Well, that's 400 quid now. Uh, anything else, we'll sort out, where, where, you know, when you come back. And I'm like, what the fuck do I do now? Um, do I turn around and go, sorry, Maz, I know who you are. Uh, I've actually been recording you as well. It's my intention to go to a rival publication and expose your nefarious, dishonest techniques of non-state entrapment uh, and behind-the-scenes manipulation and all this, that, the other. Or, or, or what do I do? So I left the room, and at that time I was escorted out by the apparent bodyguard, and I've got 400 quid of clearly mass masses and Murdochs and news of the world's money on me. So you're halfway in. <laughs> mm, uh, I'm, I'm now in the lift with the bodyguard going down, back, back down to reception of the hotel, and uh, the bodyguard says, "Don't let my, uh, don't let, don't let me boss down. I suppose you'll be going to," and mentions the name of a pub in Longsight, in the Longsight area of Manchester. So they had this all thought out then. As turns out, this modest operandi is the same for pretty much everyone, including to Lisa that we'll get to shortly. So he, he said to me, I suppose you'll be going to this pub in the Longsight area and seeing Spider. I, I bet that's who you're going to, isn't it? And I went, maybe. And what I'm really thinking in my head is, he's just told me where to source these coins from. And I realised that that would mean that the level of fabrication in Mahmood's stories was far worse and more illegal, unethical and immoral than even I had anticipated or surmised. And the journalistic part of my brain kicked in and I thought, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I went to the pub that the bodyguard had mentioned to me. And in fact, as I'm going to the pub, I realised that that pub name had been mentioned to me previously by the freelance journalist who I'd worked with over the years, who, 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 who I'd worked out, I thought, was about to put the knife in, 
it started realising that they had worked out that I was trying to stick them up. So now I've got a problem because I, 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 I think that maybe they think I know who he is. So sod it, I've nothing to lose at this point because I want, I want, I want to, you know, I want to get it in a rival publication. So I go to the pub, and lo and behold, there I don't even need to ask who Spider is. He's just uh, for you. More ridiculous than that, the guy had a tattoo of a spider on part of his face. <laughs> the big guy, he looked like you would expect a dodgy person to look. And. I went up to him, uh, but before I could say anything to him, he obviously knew who I was. Yeah, all right, he didn't know my name, but he went, "Have you come for uh, you come for fake money?" He literally said that to me, which you know further embedded the fact that this was completely manufactured, fabricated scenario. So ultimately, gave him the four hundred quid got a thousand coins why do you think they went with the coins and pushed the drug aspect aside I, I, well uh, well it, became, it must have become clear to them that i couldn't get hold of the things okay. um why why they didn't go for the um drug element that they've done with so many celebrities i i honestly don't know um maybe it was because of the way he wrote up the story about magicians doing tricks with coins and money. And it tied in with the fact that I was doing magic on TV at the time. Yeah. And they thought he could write up, because he did have a way of writing it up, the mucking ma magician who supplied the girls also did tricks with coins, you know. Yeah. It was all very tabloidy newspapers. I don't know, you'd you, you have to ask Mahmood that. Maybe um, he was hedging his bets a bit. If he thought he was going to be exposed... Maybe he assumed, well, if we go with fake coins and I get exposed, then that's, I guess, less of an issue than legally as that well, would be with drugs. I don't it, know. It, yeah, I think you could uh, you could be onto something there, which is interesting and becomes even more likely when we get a little bit further along. Because ultimately, uh, why did he go down that route? Also, earlier in meetings when he'd asked about fake coins, I, playing the part of Mr. Ganglang Man, um, reached into my pocket, took out three pound coins the genuine right yeah and i said i can get orders of them and he went wow they're the best counterfeit coins i've ever seen right and i went oh yeah they're, they're really good the guy i get them off well of course they were really good because they were genuine coins that's why they were the best counterfeit coins i'd ever seen because they were genuine coins remember that fact because it becomes very 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 relevant uh, very 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 shortly so ultimately i pick up these thousand coins i counted them there were a thousand coins that's very important as well i then later that day at the pre-arranged time go back deliver these coins to perry aka mazam and mood uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff went on but ultimately that sunday the newspaper ran with the article that children's uh, television presenting magician um, is a drug smuggling, counterfeit money supplying, Uzi gun salesman pimp. And they even tried to intimate that there was a pimp of underage girls. And they printed me as having said things that I never ever said. And there was no recorded proof of because I didn't say it. And my moods, when questioned about that by police, um, oh, the recordings went wrong at that point. Which is funny, that happened in so many of his cases. Um, anyway, the, the article appeared. So that morning, that particular Sunday morning in, as I recall, it was March 1998, I went to Rochdale Police Station with a copy of the News of the World article, got someone to come to the front desk and I pointed at the picture of me in the paper and I went, you might want to question me about these allegations. And they, they looked at me like, what kind of lunatic comes in like that? And ultimately, they went and got somebody who came out, looked at it and went, we've not been sent anything by the news of the world. We don't know anything about this. And um, therefore, we don't need to speak to you. And I went, hang on a minute. I'm telling you there's something here you need to investigate as the police. Because this is claiming 
that I've supplied counterfeit money. It's claiming that I've offered to supply drugs and guns. It's claiming that I've supplied girls to him in a manner that doesn't tie in with the reality of what really happened. Um, I want to make a complaint, let alone the fact that they're saying they're going to send you these counterfeit coins uh, and their videos and audios for you to investigate me. I want to see someone. And they actually refused to see me, honestly. Um, so I went away and it was over a week later, over a week later, and I, and I know why now, because I have documents on circusofthemind.net that I've managed to obtain uh, in the past 18 months through freedom of information and GDPR requests that have shown up, apparently didn't exist before. I was getting told no documents existed this far on, but these ones suddenly showed up that show that Mamu did not hand to the police any coins or his video recordings or audio, albeit they were all edited tapes, until exactly one week after the story had been in the newspaper, the fabricated story. Why? That's a question that's never been answered. Also, all he handed to them, as the evidence shows, is 1,000 coins in total. And yet, on one meeting, I handed him three coins, albeit they were genuine coins, and then there was the thousand coins. One thousand plus three is one thousand and three. And the videos that he gave to the police, uh, inconveniently for him, showed that I gave him three coins on one occasion and apparently a bag full the next time. So obviously he would have to dot to the evidence because he wouldn't want um, genuine pound coins, would he? going to the police if he's trying to make me look bad. So they were actually counterfeit coins that ended up... Well, I don't somewhere. know. This gets even more ridiculous. Now, I'm just surmising this bit because the documents you'll see on circusofthemind.net that I've managed to obtain in the past 18 months from courts, from the CPS, from um, the police uh, involved and um, different sources, um, show that the nature of the charges against me kept getting changed and the quantities of coins mentioned by the CPS in documents and by the police kept changing but it was always wrong it never had it never added up to 1003 coins total it was alleged uh, in some of the documents it says on one occasion I gave him three coins another occasion I gave him 996 well when you add that together that's 999 coins on other legal documentation, it says there were three coins on one occasion, 997 on another, which is a thousand coins. None of it, none of it's consistent. None of it makes sense. How long was it until you got to know that, oh, I'm actually in a bit of trouble here. They're going to charge me. Um, it was um, approximately a day well, the week after the story had gone in is when a warrant went out for my uh, questioning and arrest. Um, but I voluntarily gave myself up to the police. Um, once they contacted my lawyer, I voluntarily gave myself up and pointed out I'd already tried to speak to them. And they went, yes, we know, because we've got you on our CCTV camera coming in with the news of the world paper. So, you know, that th they understood that I genuinely was trying to be helpful with the police. Um... And I uh, said, so I'll come in whenever you want. I went in with my solicitor and we watched the um, edited, highly edited videotapes that Mahmood had covertly filmed and sent in where there was tons missing. Things were completely out of context and portrayed with no particular basis or foundation of truth. And the police themselves at the time said that they were watching them. You know you're being filmed, don't you? You keep looking in the direction of the hidden cameras. They themselves said this. And I said, well, yeah, because I set this up. I explained what I'd done. I showed them proof of sending the sign for letter in advance. I showed them what audio recordings I'd taken. They had no doubt whatsoever that my intention was to expose Muslim Mahmood, which is why, although they could have, in theory, charged me for offering to supply drugs and offering to supply guns because I verbally appeared to be doing that, they said, well, there's no chance we're doing anything with that because you didn't do anything and you've got proof that it's, you know, acting. 
Uh, unfortunately, Law, you did have in your possession for um, the period of time of leaving that pub in Longsight to getting back to the hotel, you had in your possession, therefore it's classed as delivery of counterfeit coins. Um, so we're going to have to run that past the CPS. They did, and the CPS, but I now realise this is because they did this with pretty much all of um, Mahmood's cases. There was a special division in London, special crimes unit, uh, that got contacted about Mazza Mahmood stories. Not the local branch office of CPS, head office dealt with it, special crimes unit, which is a bit bizarre in itself. Um, and they would always rubber stamp and pass through Mahmood stories because it was easy, easy convictions for them, made up the numbers. And also because I think probably Mahmood had uh, as influence at some level, certainly did, Hence, he's bragging about having senior police officers in his pocket and such like, which has come to light in recent years. So, ultimately, I got charged with two counts of delivery of counterfeit coins, one of delivering three coins and one of delivering 997 coins, or 996, or 1,000, depending on which documents you look at. Were That's they actually ridiculous. produced uh, as evidence? Well, here's the thing. From the moment of me handing those coins over to Mahmood, and let me tell you, when I counted those coins, I have to say, when I counted them, and I'm no expert uh, uh, on, on counterfeit coins, the Royal Mint would be the source for that, I'll come to in a minute, but when I counted them, and there were a thousand in that bag, when I counted them, to me... They seem like the best counterfeits I'd ever seen. I, I've been handed a dodgy pound coin in the past in a pub. We've all come across those sort of really scratchy rubbish yeah. coins that don't go in the vending machines. And As far as I'm concerned, these looked like, felt like pound coins. Now, as I'll come to in a minute, that may be because they were pound coins. I don't know for sure either way. All I do know is this. This did go to court. Um, I pleaded not guilty, obviously, because my not guilty um, because to be guilty you've got to have a criminal intent, and I had zero criminal intent as I could prove. My uh, I was acting uh, arguably. Uh, Mahmood always went on about acting in the public interest, and uh, he was therefore allowed to do things that would normally appear to be illegal, such as asking people, inciting people to buy drugs uh, or selling drugs, for example. Um, normally, that would itself be an illegal act, but if it's in the public interest of journalism, uh, that can be a lawful excuse. Um, we now know that really Mahmoud didn't have a lawful excuse for anything that he did over, the, well, the majority of what he did over the years. Some of it he did, but most of it he didn't. Um, anyway, the point is that this dragged on and on and on, and it became clear that Mahmoud was hiding the people working with him, such as those from Southern Investigations, such as, as I later found out, the freelance journalist that I got that gut instinct was trying to stab me in the back, were involved, but that he was going to hide them under journalistic privilege. That made it practically impossible for those celebrities to expose the truth of what had really gone on, even when it became obvious to them after the event through the edited splice tapes and stuff that something wasn't right. The fact that he was hiding his sources and he had journalistic privilege meant it was an unfair legal process. Um, so at the last minute, I changed my plea to guilty with mitigating circumstances, namely the mitigating circumstances of then explaining that I had proof that I was trying to expose Mazza Mahmood. That, for anyone who's cynical and thinks, yeah, right, whatever, just go to circusofthemind.net, see the press cuttings from the Manchester Evening News who ran the story the next day about what had gone on in court when I pleaded guilty at the last minute, and you will see that they quote the judge uh, and stuff, and the judge, the police, the CPS, they all acknowledge that I knew I was dealing with Mazama Mood. That is without question. As ridiculous as my, my, my attempt to expose him may sound, 
the police, the CPS, even the judge, none of them um, questioned the fact that I knew who he was and had done that because they'd seen the evidence that proved that was fact. Ultimately, because I did plead guilty with mitigating circumstances, because I've been told if I did that, that I'd just walk out of court with a suspended sentence or something. And then I would still be in a position to go to a newspaper with what I had and expose his nefarious techniques. Um, and it would perhaps be even in an easier sell with this suspended sentence, you know, it having slightly backfired. Unfortunately... I got really bad legal advice, which seems to happen in a lot of um, Mahmood-related cases, especially when you're using duty solicitors and stuff on legal aid, as I was doing at the time. Some may suggest that they have a vested interest in obtaining convictions. Maybe, allegedly. Anyway, ultimately I was, because I pleaded guilty, was found guilty, and um, much to my surprise also much to the police's surprise because the police actually gave me a reference in court saying that they knew that i was trying to expose my mood and that was i had no criminal intention and that in fact if it was down to them they wouldn't have taken it to court but it's the cps who made that decision and they actually were my main character references the police uh, in court um unfortunately the judge said that because it involved a coin of the realm the stone's book of the law uh said that he could have given me up to seven years but that because i had no criminal record whatsoever no run-ins with the police no history this was clearly an isolated case and because of the extraordinary circumstances that phrase was used in other words acknowledging the fact that uh, you know i was doing this to try and expose Mahmoud's activities, that he, he would limit the sentence to six months and that I was fortunate that they were just about to launch the HDC system, Home Detention Curfew System, in about six weeks' time and that he would recommend, as would the police and the probation, that given the circumstances, I would be released on electronic tag, HDC, at the earliest opportunity. I got took down to the holding cell in Manchester Crown Court, and my solicitor came down and spoke to me, and um, I said, what, what, can we appeal? And he said, on what basis? I said, well, journalistic license. If, 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 if Mazza Mahmood is allowed for journalistic purposes to purchase alleged counterfeit coins of me in the course of a story, surely I should be allowed to deliver them in the course of a story without getting charged. And I said, surely that. And, and he went, well, no, I don't. I don't I, mm, you know, if, if we did appeal, you might end up with a longer sentence. Now, I now know that to be completely untrue. It appears I was given bad advice. Whether that was through incompetence or on purpose, I don't know. Um, but ultimately, I did not appeal my case. I thought, I've got to bite the bullet. That's it. And the fact is, I'll be out in about six weeks, hopefully, because they've recommended the home detention curfew. And that's pretty much how it went. I always, from, always stated that I was innocent of any criminal intent, that it was always about exposing the mood, and unfortunately, I didn't get a newspaper to cover my story when I got out of prison because I'd had a sentence, so it wasn't really a story of interest to them. Well, what was going through your mind as you realise, oh, I'm actually going to have to spend some weeks in prison now? I mean, I'm assuming you, you hadn't had anything like that before. So. No, I, I, to say I was scared is an understatement. Uh, and I don't want to go into too much detail about how it impacted me because I don't want really to get upset, but when I was interviewed on uh, Newsnight after Mazza Mahmood was uh, imprisoned uh, in recent years, um, it was a very emotional, uh, scary, upsetting time. I can't describe what it was like from the moment that the judge said, send him down. Your mind plays tricks on you. Uh, it, was, it was just, it was a living nightmare. So then, obviously... The years go by, and uh, over those years, it's caused me all amounts of problems because people um, were inclined not to believe my 
factual version of events. Their, their, their reaction always was, well, if you were trying to expose Mazen Mahmood, why did you get sent down? Surely you should have been given journalistic license like he should. Well, I've now found out that that's true. Legally, I should have been given journalistic license like he was. And that is why that forms one of my, the grounds of my renewed uh, appeal that was submitted to the Courts of Appeal on the 24th of May uh, 2019, last year. Um, the years went by, and then in 2014... British pop star Talisa Contostavlos um, was exposed apparently by the Sun on Sunday for offering to supply drugs to uh, Mazen Mahmood. And she swore blind that, it, it, you know, the tapes had been edited, it was fabricated, she'd been intimidated behind the scenes, um, that, you know, like other people have said, they were handed stuff to hand to Mahmood, but they never actually bought it. All manner of different things. And she was also promised, you know, all these wonderful things were going to happen to her career if she... Oh, yes, enticement. Yeah. I was offered, you know, TV series, massive money. John Alford was offered, you know, millions of pounds to be in starring roles alongside Robert De Niro and other heroes of his. Um, and I was offered a TV contract. She was offered massive stuff. Yeah, they, they, they were enticement, entrapment, which in itself is illegal arguably um it certainly would be classed as illegal and non-admissible as evidence if the british police were to use such techniques um anyway her uh, her legal team managed to uh trip up mahmoud um in court hearings and the judge investigated further and ultimately the judge slayed that trial meaning he brought it to an end and categorically stated that he felt Maza Mahmood had lied perjured um, you know perjured himself arguably um and this then led to the question the case against Talisa was dropped she was exonerated of all charges um as quite rightfully she should have been and um, then there was all this waiting around of will the police charge Mazen Mahmood for perjury? Um, and what happened is uh, later in 2014, BBC Panorama, after numerous attempts by uh, the Murdoch organisation and Mahmood's lawyers to stop them showing it, uh, and including trying to get the... Um, Attorney General at the time, I think, or the Home Secretary, people in real power to contact the BBC and try and halt the panorama being shown. They broadcast the fake shake exposed about how the Talisa trial had collapsed and investigated what had really gone on in the cases of uh, John Alford, in the cases of world heavyweight boxer Herbie Hydes, in the cases of um, former glamour model and now actress Emma Morgan and a bunch of other people. And they fully exposed through former associates of Mahmoud's and who'd worked with him, journalists and informants and stuff, that... Um, that he framed people, he set them up, he planted evidence, he intimidated people, he edited... He, there was all, all the things we spoke about and more were exposed in this programme. For 30 years, he has revelled in hiding his identity. His lucrative career depends on it. The self-styled King of the Sting, turning up to court every day beneath the balaclava. But today, the hunter became the hunted. Miss Mummy, what would you like to say to Why did you tamper with the evidence say to Talissa? Would you like to apologise for Talissa? Are you sorry? You're guilty of lying to secure a scoop. What do you say to that? Did you lie to get a front page headline? What do you say to that? The man who once spent thousands on injunctions against those who would print his picture, with his conviction, couldn't stop his mugshot being freely published. Maza Mahmood unmasked. Here he is. So ultimately, it was no surprise that eventually that the police did uh, charge Mahmood with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice because they found out that his driver was involved, um, Alan Smith. And 
obviously down the line what that meant was that ultimately he ended up going to trial at the old bailey in london the consequence of which i attended at all of the court hearings and the sentencing um along with john alford emma morgan um herbie hydes and other victims of uh, high profile victims of uh, mahmood we attended and witnessed and well fortunately at the end of the day the jury finally got to learn the truth and he was unanimously all 12 jury members found him and his driver unanimously guilty of conspiracy to pervert the course of justice in the trial of Talisa Contostavlos. It uncovered the fact that his modest operandi in her case was practically identical to that used in mine, John Alford's, Herbie Hyde's and a whole bunch of other people. Um, and he was imprisoned for a 15 month sentence. And finally, because of his sent, him getting sent down that night, I was on news night with Emma Morgan, Herbie Hyde, John Alford. And um, finally, it, it was like that vindicated me to anyone who, who'd been critical, saying, well, if you tried setting up my mood and that truly was his modest operandi, then why did you end up in prison? This kind of showed that everything I'd been saying since 1998 was true. That is, you know, it had been shown that his modest operandi with all these other people as well was the same as I'd uncovered and been saying was the case. So how is your appeal going? Well, that's an interesting one because um, when the Panorama show went on towards the end of 2014, uh, I heard John Alford and his lawyer talking about the, the fact that this gave them grounds for appeal. And I thought, surely that means me as well. So I contacted the lawyer, and after some to and fro um they finally agreed to take me on pro bono. Uh, and the long story cut short is that that appeal, the single judge turned me down. Okay? The single judge turned me down. So, but then, before I even knew that the single judge, considering the appeal, had turned it down, my lawyer at the time sent my case to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, the CCRC. And then later that day, she sent me an email saying, the single judge has turned you down, so I've sent your case to the CCRC. That's the first I knew about it. That's relevant in a minute. So literally, a matter of almost two years later, it's fully explained on circusofthemind.net, the CCRC turned me down because their argument is that I've not raised any new evidence that... Um, the single judge hadn't already considered i had but they said they again were of a mind that you know my argument about i should have journalistic privilege wasn't strong enough which i've since found that I argued right it would be strong enough but anyway more has come to light since then um so then i thought well that's it there's nothing i can do single judge has turned it down ccrc's turned it down <sighs> what do i do and time went by, and then I, I suddenly sent some emails out to the secret barrister on Twitter, the author of the book, The Secret Barrister, not expecting a reply, but I got one saying to me, well, why don't you renew your appeal? And I responded, because it's been turned down. And he responded saying, no, the single judge has turned it down, but it's not been turned down properly by the Court of Appeal. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the next course of action after the single judge turning it down, it doesn't mean it won't get to appeal. It doesn't mean it hasn't got merit to be appealed and that you won't win. It just means that single judge, his personal opinion is, for whatever reason. What should have happened then is that your appeal was uh, resubmitted, renewed, escalated to the full court. I went, you are? And I, I discovered that rather than having been referred to the CCRC, my case should have been sent back to the Court of Appeal to be considered by uh, a panel of three judges who would then decide whether it had merit to go to a full hearing. Now, I am not, I just want to make it clear, I'm not saying that my legal team at the time acted incompetently or anything. I don't believe they did. I believe it was a case of, because I was the only person who hadn't previously appealed their case, 
So everyone else, the route, their route to trying and get justice was to go to the CZRC. I believe that they felt it would be stronger for me to be part of a class action group of cases with the CZRC, if that makes sense. Uh, unfortunately, as it turned out, that, 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 that didn't work. So unbeknownst to me, I still have the option of going to the full court of appeal to get this book before three judges to consider if there was merit. And if two out of three of them thought there was some merit, then it could go to a hearing. Well, in the meantime, I'd been getting whatever evidence I could through GDPR requests. GDPR laws had come in. And documents I've been told have been destroyed years ago. I've got letters on file from the police, CPS, saying no documents exist because it's so long ago. But suddenly, under GDPR rules, I got sent stuff I'd been told didn't exist, which is interesting. And copies of these documents are all there for everyone to see on circusandamind.net. Amongst those documents of key, key interest are all the documents that show they can't decide whether there's 996 coins in total, 999, 997, 1,000 or 1,003. There's all the documents that show they can't decide whether I'm getting charged with one count or two counts. There's, most importantly, the documents that show that the Crown Prosecution Service, when my case was first put to appeal to the single judge, categorically stated in their documents that the coins were proven to be counterfeit by the Royal Mint. Okay? Key important, but that they hadn't yet heard back off the Royal Mint with the supporting documents, but they categorically said they'd been given to the Royal Mint. Now, in more recent times, I have managed to acquire from the Royal Mint through GDPR requests, categorically, black and white, confirmation that they do keep records from that time period and would still have records from that time period. Point one. Point two, that they check their records against all of my stage names and also against News of the World, Mazama Mood, etc. and all of the references and that they have nothing on file connected to any of those whatsoever. Which would seem to indicate they were never sent any coins to check at that time. When I put that as part of my renewed grounds of appeal, that the Crown Prosecution Service in their respondents notice, which they submitted in August last year, 2019, with their reasons of why they felt that the conviction should stand, a few things happen in that. Firstly, they do not address the fact that in my renewed grounds of appeal, I point out I should have had journalistic license in the same way as Mahmood was afforded it. They just ignore that point entirely. Secondly, they completely ignore the fact that I provide evidence in my renewed grounds of appeal that the CPS and the police both knew Mahmood was not a witness to be trusted and that had criminal connections and a been involved with criminal activity prior to 1998 when this took place so I should have been disclosed that information to my legal team so they failed to disclose vital information that could have affected my case they just chose to completely ignore that fact in their respondents notice but they do mention the fact that I've got an email from the Royal Mint in fact they supply an email themselves they get from the Royal Mint because they contact the Royal Mint to ask them if the email I've submitted is real or not. <laughs> okay? You can see the documents on circusofthemind.net. They categorically ask the Royal Mint, is this real? And the Royal Mint come back and say, yes, I had contacted them with a GDPR request and that is the email response that they, they had given. Now, they do then add one backtracking line of we cannot categorically 100% state that perhaps there were records at the time that have been lost, but bear in mind that, that in the contact to me, they categorically state they do keep records from that time period and that there was nothing related to me or that case, which means that either A, nothing was ever sent to them, or B, the Royal Mint of lost my records, but not everyone else's from that time? I don't think so. I think they probably never got sent there in the first place, which the evidence seems to indicate. Uh, also, the fact that the CPS in their respondents' notice make a request to the court 
that my emails and evidence from the Royal Mint is not considered and should not be included in my evidence. What they're trying to cover up, their incompetence, the fact that they took me to court without any actual evidence that those coins could have actually been genuine and real. So what's the next step? It's a waiting game now, you know. As recently as the, the last communication I got from the uh, Corps of Appeal was about the roughly the 19th of May 2020 this year. And in that, they finally re answered an email to me and confirmed to me that my case was supposed to have been written up by a summary writer before Christmas. But that summary writer had quit their job and that I'd gone to the back of the queue rather than my case being given to somebody else there and then. So it is awaiting to be seen by a summary writer who will write up the basic facts of what evidence I've got. So hopefully they'll put in there the fact that I've got evidence the coins were never forensically checked by the Royal Mint, that the CPS and police never disclosed to me vital information that would have proved my innocence and proved Mahmood's dishonesty at the time, um, and a whole bunch of other things. Uh, including the circumstantial evidence I have that I was probably drugged with a date rape drug uh, to make me more um, suggestible and compliant and more likely to do things I wouldn't normally have done or say things I wouldn't normally have said. And this, as you'll see on circusofthemind.net, happened to loads of other people and, you know, who, who said that they felt drunker than they ever should have done. Well, that's a side effect of date rape drug. And... Um, we know now that, you know, Southern investigations that Mahmood has been linked to extensively have, you know, been linked with all manner of allegations, some proven true, some yet not proven true, but they have been linked to drugs, the supplying of, stitching people up with, uh, with counterfeit money. There's been suggestions of Mahmood being linked with counterfeit money in the past. So, you know, it, it, it's a waiting game now. The truth of the matter is, if this was to come to court now, today, forget any of the appeal, if this was to be brought to the CPS now, it would never get to court, let alone there being any possibility of me ever being found guilty of something that I shouldn't have been because I should have had journalistic license and because there was never any real evidence and because my mood had acted, you know, uh, inappropriately and illegally in many fashions. Uh, he just wouldn't make it because he's been now totally proven to be a non-trustworthy person. Did any of the other people manage to... I mean, are they all still stuck in appeals or did anyone actually manage to clear their names? Um, unfortunately, all the vast majority of people who had already appealed years ago, so they didn't have that course of action available to them. They only had the root of the CCRC who felt that there was no new evidence at the time. Now, there is new evidence appearing. I can't talk about it uh, in cases of other people. I can't talk about it because that would be contempt of court because yeah. there are cases going on in the high courts where new evidence is coming to light at all times within which Mahmood is implicated, um, including links to the royal family and stuff. But they, they were hoping you would go away once you got a sort of modest sentence. Here's the big picture. This is, you, you've hit the nail on the head. When that new evidence comes to light for those people, they will then be in a position to uh, arguably go back to the CCRC because there's new evidence. And I believe that they will then get their convictions overturned because of the fact that Mahmood's been proven to be not a witness of truth because the new additional evidence will be there of his um, illegal actions, okay? In my case, I think it's been made hard along the way um, and CPS have been fighting what I think is a pointless fight because, you know, the moment, the moment Talisa's trial collapsed, there were a number of cases against footballers and other people in the works to be taken to court for criminal charges against footballers and various other people based on Mahmood stories that were instantly dropped because of the CPS's own statement said Mahmood could no longer be relied upon as a witness of truth so there was no chance of a conviction. Which means that if any of our cases were happening now and taken to, attempted to be took to court now, they'd never pass that... Um, 
threshold test. They just wouldn't. They, they wouldn't get to court. Simple as. Which do means. We know, do we know what he's doing now? Is he? We don't for certain. There was certainly talk that uh, he may have been doing it. There was a, a link byline publications byline investigates no. um showed that uh, uh during the epstein madness he sold helped a colleague sell some pictures to uh, a national newspaper with a story about epstein uh there's rumors that he still does stuff for murdoch uh but you know maybe under a different name or on a freelance basis, we don't know. Um, the bits I do know I can't talk about because they'll come out in time during the high court cases that are going on relating to phone hacking and other illegal methods of... Uh, I mean, so, like, books. after all these years, you, you're still... I mean, we've had Leveson, we've had the phone hacking thing, the news of the world is gone, but you've still not got any faith in in the press definitely not Leveson Inquiry Part 2 is the biggest cover up of all time um, Matt Hancock when he was media secretary helped sweep that under the carpet and why you know that, and that is what happened because Part 2 was going to investigate and expose uh, the links between the media and corruption between the media politicians uh serving police officers, including Scotland Yard, and probably also corruption, uh, possibly uh, within uh, some elements of the CPS as well, or certainly some incompetencies over the years. Um, a lot of that evidence is out there in relation directly to Mazam and Moon, for example, on my circus of the mind.net. It's in the public domain, the stuff that can be talked about, which when you look at it, if any of that was to be considered by a court of appeal, you just... Anyway, it's not because I'm close to it. I can tell you that there isn't a single one of Mahmoud's convictions, you know, convictions that have been obtained based on Mahmoud's evidence. None of them should stand. There may be some where people were genuinely guilty, like child traffickers. There might have been the odd genuine story he did. But those then should be retried on the basis of other evidence without Mahmoud's involvement. Because the fact is... There's too many uh, out there that are quite easily shown to be based on fabricated, uh, manipulated, edited, bullshit evidence or circumstances that were created through drugging people, manipulating them with fear or just outright making things up and saying that people said things that they never actually said. And then, oh, sorry, I've lost that audio recording. Well, even just at a base level, none of these situations would have happened without him instigating them in the first place. Even if some of these people yeah. might have had bad intentions or could have been led in certain ways, they wouldn't have done that because these things don't happen this way, do they? So he brought it out of people. When If they were just walking down the street one day, they, they wouldn't have done it. So it's... it's no. At least it's immoral, but <laughs> at worst, it's just completely criminal. Yeah, um, which, you know, I mean, the evidence shows and the way the law is that it is what he did for years was and is completely criminal. And it's laughable that he, you know, he provably lied in part one of the Leveson inquiry. He provably perjured himself uh, in terms of what he said and what's come to light because of the collapsed Talisa case. Um, Matt Hancock as media secretary at the time helped sweep Leveson part two under the carpet because obviously the government um, I would argue will do what Rupert Murdoch wants them to do so that Rupert Murdoch will through his media channels continue to be seen to broadly support them you know Murdoch's back the winning prime minister for decades if he says somebody's going to win they do, which means they're all they all favours to him. It's you know, he'll even flip flop which party he supports. <laughs> yeah, as long yeah. as he can get them. <laughs> um, because he wanted, and Murdoch definitely wouldn't want Leveson Part Two to take place. He's already spent out billions. I think it's in the over a billion pound now, but certainly in the multi multi millions of pounds obscene money, paying people off on the doorstep, settling phone hacking damages claims that he always said never took place 
both for the news of the world and now the Sun newspaper. You know, people have taken cases, these categorically, till the day the trial's supposed to have started, uh, said, no, we're defending this, it's never happened. And then they made an on the doorstep settlement. And they've done this time and time again with people after people. What, what is it they don't want coming out in the evidence in court? I know the answer to that, but I'm not allowed to tell you. Could that be contempt of court? Why does he keep paying them off? Leveson Inquiry Part 2 would have uncovered that. If you could talk to Mazza Mahmood right now, what would you say to him? Um, I don't think I'd really say anything to him other than it's only a matter of time. You, The truth is largely out there. But the real final pieces of the jigsaw, so to speak, will hopefully finally be revealed over the coming kind of towards the end of next year or into next year, depending on how long these particular um, sets of phone hacking and related uh, cases in the High Court take to uncover uh, certain things. And that also depends on whether people settle on, settle on the doorstep, because if they settle, keep settling on the doorstep, a lot of the evidence that's there I can't talk about that I've got some knowledge of um, may never see the light of day. But I, I, I can say that there is somebody, who, uh, I won't mention their name for obvious reasons, who fully intends to refuse any doorstep offer purely for the purpose of getting said evidence to be revealed in open court so that it can benefit all of Mahmood's victims over the decades so that they can finally get the justice that they deserve. There you have it folks, that was Alex Smith, otherwise known as Jonathan Royal. A really wild case with lots of sensational aspects to explore, but then that's every case linked to the fake shake from selling wannabe terrorists fake chemicals like red mercury to staging a, a kidnapping threat on the beckhams his whole career was about manufacturing sensational stories at the expense of real people and if you're not familiar with maza mahmood or have forgotten about the subject because you know the bulk of this happened a few years ago now definitely watch the panorama episode on the fake shake. There are also other podcasts that have further explored the Southern Investigations link, this group of private investigators who sort of doubled as Mahmood's bodyguards and helpers, and they have ties to the police and all sorts of shady activities. Of course, you can dig into Alex's own case a bit further at circusofthemind.net. And if you want to know more about his hypnotherapy work and, and hypnosis training courses and all the things like that that he does, there's also MagicalGuru.com. All of the links for that are on the show page and the various sites that the podcast is aggregated on. I also want to do a quick shout out to some of the listeners who have supported Wide Shirt over the years. Uh, it's nice to see that you're all still around and uh, especially since I've taken so many months off from actually doing content. So I want to shout out people like Mrs. Mel Gibson, otherwise known as Nathaniel Spatchcock, <laughs> Vince Neb, um, John Dixon, P3T3RG1, uh, Imani Hakima. Also, obviously, cheers to Stu Wyatt, who recently discussed his experience with coronavirus, and also Daniel Bostock, who came on the show a few weeks ago as well, to discuss his overall perspective on free speech and his parody music videos and all sorts of other interesting things. I do have some other potential guests in the works, um, some names from the past in alternative media. Uh, well, not that they've gone anywhere, it's me that went off to do a journalism degree. But yeah, there's, there's definitely some more shows in the works, I won't give too much away because nothing's finalised but I am certainly aiming to do more shows. Of course, you can follow me spouting off on Twitter at Alt News UK. Facebook and YouTube is Wide Shut UK. And you can get the MP3 and Stitcher links and everything like that for the webcast and all of my other work at wideshut.co.uk. 
but we're around two hours now, so uh, I'll wrap things up, and I hope you all have a good evening.